Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeff Finkel, CEO of the ArcView Group, and our program today is Mastering the New York Cannabis License Application. You know, um, the way we think about it, our digital programming, our true North Star, has always been to promote meaningful discussion that are both timely and nuanced, and also to simplify the subject matter. So I am going to apologize in advance because nothing about this topic is simple. There's a lot about the final regs we don't know yet. And complicating the matter is the overhang of the litigation currently against the New York Office of Cannabis Management. So complicated, unfortunately, is what we're dealing with. That said, I promise you that you're going to be a lot more prepared to pursue a licensed cannabis business after this program than you were before. And as one of our panelists will say to you today, despite what we don't know about the final regs, being flat-footed for sure is a losing strategy. So business hopefuls, you need to be in action now. Because let's face it, New York by far will be the largest cannabis market. I think it's expected to be between five and seven billion at maturity. And the program, we do know this, does favor smaller independent businesses as opposed to big canna. So if you're ready to create generational wealth, this is the opportunity. Now, I don't think I can be a proper host this first week of September without calling attention to some of the news in our industry last week. <laughs> wow. I mean, as many of you know, because I'm sure you're reading, the Department of Health and Human Services made its formal recommendation to the DEA to reschedule cannabis from Schedule 1 to, to Schedule 3. Now, this is probably the most significant development on the regulatory front of this decade, and some might argue ever. Um, but there's a lot that's unclear, right? Will the DEA act on the recommendation? If so, when and what are the implications of the UN Single Convention on Narcotics that has to be considered? And the Schedule 3 paved the way for Big Pharma to dominate? And if so, what are the M&A implications? A lot to digest. Um, and a lot's been written about this, but I would tell you that the, I think the best two thought leadership pieces on this topic are from Todd Harrison of CB1 Capital and one of today's panelists, Jeff Schultz from Foley Hogue. I think we have some links, Carolyn, if you maybe could put them in the chat so people can grab those links and, and read later. Now, also, and I'm trying to hold back, I'm trying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Ugh. Maybe progress on safe banking this fall. I know, I know I can hear like the collective audience sighing, but strong comments about priority were made by, Senator, by the Senate Banking uh, Committee Chair, Sherrod Brown, and Majority Leader Schumer last week. I mean, so it was a pretty, pretty incredible week. I know, what, it's the eighth time? I mean, maybe eighth time is the charm. I don't know what to say, but I'll tell you what, let's not give it negative energy. Let's keep our fingers crossed. All right, moving forward, let's set the stage for today. First, let's learn a little bit about you. Carolyn, can we put that poll up? Um, so everybody, please take a couple of seconds to complete it. I think it should be popping up on your screen any minute. There it is. Uh, do this while I quickly introduce the ArcView group to you. Now, I know many of you have been part of the ARCV community since we started in 2010. And I know that some of you are unfamiliar with our history, so let me tell you who we are. So ARCV was founded by Troy Dayton and Steve D'Angelo in 2010. And you know Troy and Steve's mission was to create a first of its kind and really much needed safe haven for both investors and entrepreneurs, and certainly with social equity at their core. They were appalled, and they remain appalled, at the stigma around cannabis and the related social justice issues. Now, our core offering at the time was an investor network um, where investor and conference producer, and we still produce conferences. Um, our next one will be actually in San Fran on February 22nd, but really a place for investors and entrepreneurs to convene and meet and get to know each other and hopefully transact. Um, so we still produce those conferences, and we're going to continue to produce the digital webinars like the one we're doing today. Uh, we all want to keep learning. You know, there's so much to learn in this sector, and things change very quickly. Now, in, to, in addition to that sort of core 
uh, uh, digital and in-person conference business, we operate a venture fund called the r Collective Fund. Most of the companies in the fund are at the early growth stage, but going forward, we are focused on what we're calling resets and rocket ships. That's just a fun way to say companies that are either being restructured or experience substantial growth. Another part of our ecosystem is our consulting arm that provides a variety of services. Now, once I pass this off to Jason Malcolm, who's our host, he's gonna give you a, a, a little bit of an overview of the services that consulting offers. But one service I will call your attention to, and we recently just launched this, it's a service to help companies restructure and if need be, wind down comfortably and efficiently outside the court system as a liquidation advisor. So if this applies to you, please contact me personally. We hosted a webinar about this topic last spring, and you can certainly go to our replays page and hear it there. Actually, I encourage you to go to our replay page. Uh, we have an impactful, a series of impactful programs with industry thought leaders there. I think they've been seen by over 36,000 people who have registered for our program since 2020. Lastly, we have a marketing services arm that offers a full range of services, including collateral, website development, lead gen, strategy, and fractional CMO services. Carolyn, maybe let's put some links to both of those, uh, all three of those ecosystem members of the ARCU group. All right, before we move on to the program, let me just take a moment to thank our strategic alliance partners. First, Millennial Strategies, which offers government relations and advocacy services. You're gonna, Jeff uh, Guillou from Millennials, one of our panelists today, so you can learn more about them when Jeff has his chance to speak. The Cannabis Team, offering cannabis staffing an exec search, Arcstone Securities and Investments, which provides capital advisory and fundraising services, Supernet, a provider of closed loop credit card services for cannabis dispensaries, and our data analytics partner, Hoodie Analytics. So we, we appreciate their support and we uh, acknowledge their rightful place in this ecosystem and community. All right, let's get started on the program. Let me introduce you to our moderator, Jason Malcolm. Jason is the operating principal at Arcview Management Consulting. Jason joins us after a, a consulting career at Capco and e ENY, where he focused on risk management, performance optimization, and project management. Off to you, Jason. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for the kind words. <clears throat> um, so as Jeff said, my name is Jason Malcolm. I am one of the principals at Arcview Management Consulting. A little bit about Arcview Consulting at a very high level. Uh, we focus on supporting pre-revenue and post-revenue brands and operators entering into new and existing markets. And that could be either through state applications, which is kind of what our webinar is focused on today, the New York State process, federal licensing, so DEA licensing, or through a contract manufacturing type of service. We also help our clients understand consumer purchasing behavior and select markets, advise on facility setup and logistics, and offer merger and acquisition advisory services. So that's a little bit about ArcView Consulting. And if you want to know more, please definitely reach out to me directly and I could provide that list of services for you and we could dive into what we offer our clients on a day-to-day -day basis. So in today's webinar, each one of our participants will touch upon the following topics. What we know and don't know about the rules and regulations of New York, which would be very interesting because I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of questions. Real estate site selection challenges, navigating municipal governments, components of a winning application, and how to operationalize retail. So our panel today includes some of, the, some of New York's most experienced cannabis professional services leaders. I'll begin by introducing Jeffrey Schultz, a partner at Foley & Hogue LLP. Jeffrey is focused on rules and regulations in the cannabis industry. Kristen Jordan, founder and CEO of Park Jordan. Kristen provides real estate opportunities for cannabis operators. Jeff, Jeff Guillou, founder, founding partner of Millennial Strategies. Jeffrey focuses on government and advocacy services. John Engel, 
we consider another principal here at RQ Consulting. John is our application writer and a regulatory expert in, expert in all medicinal and recreational states. John has experience in competitive and non-competitive markets, and he wins the application. And then last but not least, Desmond Lewis, social equity advocate. Desmond's a social equity advocate and operations educator. Um, very smart in the New York space, as well as other states in operations. So for those who attended our previous webinars, we've taken a little bit of a different approach for today. So I intend to allocate at least 12 minutes to each person to speak to their areas of expertise. I might jump in from time to time to ask a few questions during those 12 minutes. So we may or may not have enough time of the 15 minutes that we allocated to Q&A to really get through everyone's questions. So what I encourage you to do is during the webinar, if a question comes up, don't wait to the very end to put it into the chat box. I would put it in the chat box right away with your name, your email address in case we don't get to it during the Q&A session. And then we can revert back to you uh, later in the day with some of those answers to your questions. Um, so before I begin, once again, panelists, thank you so much for attending today and taking the time out of your day for this session. Much appreciated on our end. Um, and with that being said, Jeff Schultz, I'll turn it to you. If you can, for all, pa all panelists going forward, just please introduce yourself and then feel free to dive in uh, to your area of expertise on these slides. Thank you so much. You got it. Thanks, Jason. Um, <clears throat> thank you to our few. Uh, this is great. Uh, very, I think, uh, timely. It should be finally after a couple of years of uh, talking a lot about this. Uh, so my name is Jeff Schultz. I'm a, uh, a partner at Foley Hoag in the corporate department and in the cannabis practice group. Foley Hoag is a, uh, a global uh, platform law firm uh, with offices across the United States and, and, and Europe. And um, my, my, my focus is uh, exclusively in the cannabis industry. I've been practicing for 17 years, uh, corporate law, primarily in the private equity and hedge fund industry, and I've been dedicated to the cannabis business for, for the last five years exclusively. Um, I'm an executive uh, committee member of the, uh, the New York State Bar Association Cannabis Committee. Um, I do some pro bono work and an advisor to the Weldon Project, which is a 501c3 dedicated to criminal justice reform, and a couple of other um, projects that I'm involved in and have co-founded two, um, two plant-touching businesses on the East Coast and have done a lot of uh, consulting and independent advisory work uh, prior to joining Foley. Uh, I've been uh, deeply involved in New York cannabis for, for the last five years, um, as have many of the panelists, and I'm ready to see this market really get going. So um, what do we know? What do we don't know? Uh, I was joking earlier that you know what we know is going to be a really quick presentation. We don't know a whole lot, but, uh, but we do have a lot of regs. We have hundreds and hundreds of pages of draft regulations. What we do know is that uh, they should be adopted next week on Tuesday at the next uh, Cannabis Control Board hearing. Um, assuming that that does happen, the regs, the, the, the bulk of the regulations will be final. Uh, one thing that's missing from the regulations uh, from an application perspective, we haven't seen really much on consumption lounge licenses. So uh, I know I get a lot of questions about that. So that's one thing we don't know. We have not seen that. Um, what, we don't, what we don't know on that front, I'm going to go back and forth on this because they seem to kind of line up well. What we don't know is whether the OCM is really going to do that on Tuesday. Uh, we have to assume that they will, um, that they're going to announce when that window opens. The window is not going to open next Tuesday, but they're going to announce when it will open. They have um, filed in court and made statements in, in court that they that they will open that window in the month of October, whether that's early, middle, or the end of October. For purposes of application writing, it, it's like tomorrow, right? Uh, that's not a lot of time, and you'll see in the coming slides and, and for my fellow panelists, why that's uh, not a lot of time at all. And, and, and you know, being caught flat footed is, is a, it's a losing strategy. Uh, I think now is the time to really get going. Um, I'm betting that they do um, actually give us that date. Whether we're going to see a mock-up of the application as TBD, I sure hope we do. Uh, be, it would be great to get 30 days advance notice of that application. Um, we'll know a lot more when we do see the application. Um, one more thing we could we definitely know about is there is a robust social and economic equity plan. Um, the card program is technically not supposed to be part of that program. That's a very technical issue. We won't get into that, but 
Um, there are certain categories and certain criteria for social and economic equity licenses. Um, like I said, one thing we don't know on that front is, frankly, whether the card program is going to survive at all. It's subject to a current uh, legal challenge in, in upstate New York, and uh, it doesn't look great, quite honestly. Uh, what we don't know is how that story ends. Uh, you can guess and you can speculate an awful lot about that, but um, I think that's for really for another time. Um, when it comes to license types, what do we know about that? Right, we, we know that you can apply for nursery, you know, babies, right? Uh, that's more of a genetics play, uh, what they like. Cultivation, processing, distributor, retail consumption, and micro business. Um, the most important thing to know here and, and really getting to the next point is, is what a true party in interest is and what this architecture really is about. Um, the regulatory framework is styled after the liquor industry. And it looks most like in the cannabis industry, it looks most like the state of Washington, if anything, but it, it really looks like the liquor industry where there is a two tiered system. Um, if you are in the supply tier, you are in the supply tier full stop. If you are in the retail tier, you are in the retail tier. You cannot sneeze at somebody in the other tier based on those regulations. What does that really mean? Um, you cannot even have, um, you know, and Jeff Finkel and I have talked about this ad nauseum over the last year and really just kind of uh, fetched to each other about it, but you can't even have an indirect interest, no matter how small it is, in a cultivation, manufacturing, or processing, um, or distribution license anywhere in the country and own a direct or indirect interest in a dispensary in New York. If you are and you're on that application, you will not win a license uh, and vice versa. So it's, um, you know, if I could boil all of this down in the hundreds of pages of draft regulations that are out there, this is probably the most important thing to know about uh, before you before you even decide to apply, let alone submit your application. So the definition of a true party of interest is extremely critical. Uh, it's extremely important to understand this uh, before you even apply. Uh, but you know, you otherwise you you may run the risk of just losing um, losing in the application process from day one because you are disqualified. Um, while we know that there is a social and economic equity plan, um, and we have regulations to that effect, we don't know, we know the categories of priority, right? You have, um, people have been disproportionately impacted based on where they live, where you come from, um, services disabled veterans, minority women-owned businesses, and, um, look, with the, one thing we don't know, while they receive priority, we don't know what that priority really means. And the regulations are somewhat ambiguous on that front. And why is that important for this process? It, 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 it's, it, it, it implicates the timing of the awards of the licenses and the scoring. So if you are in a priority group, as of today, we don't know whether that priority means you're gonna get your license first or whether you're going to score higher on your application or both. Uh, it's going to be one of those two or maybe both. We don't know yet. There is a possibility, and this goes back to the card uh, lawsuit. There is a possibility that retail licenses are, you know, uh, don't go out first unless you have a card license. Um, again, that's speculation. There is a possibility that OCM allows all of the card applicants, card licensees, to reapply under the social and economic equity plan, and they might be the first ones to be uh, awarded licenses. We, we we just don't know what the answer to that is. Um, and one thing that we don't know, and I know it doesn't come up a ton, but the RO program, the medical program is alive. Um, I don't know, wouldn't quite say it's alive and well, but it's alive. And um, it's going to be expanded. It, it has to be expanded. Uh, there's a statutory mandate to expand it, in fact. So um, one thing that is not discussed often, but you know, if it's of interest, if you really do want a vertical license is you can at some point apply for an RO license. Uh, unclear when that will be, unclear how competitive it will be. I, I assume it will be extremely competitive. And I think the most important question uh, that comes up and, and I make sure that people know about it when it, when it when it comes in my circle is if you apply for a new RO license, are you gonna be subject to that $20 million tax uh, that, that that's applied to the ROs if you want to cross over into the adult use market? Um, if that's the case, I, I can't see any reasonable any reasonable human being uh, wanting that sort of obligation. That's not, that's not a good thing to have. Um, that's just, uh, you're gonna be rewarded with the right to pay the state $20 million. So hopefully that that's uh, reasonable minds will 
come to the conclusion that that won't be the case for the new ROs. Um, the, the, the way that the real estate market is working and the way that the, the battle over real estate, which we're going to get to later on, I think Kristen's going to talk about that more. Um, one of the most important implications in the application process here is that you can apply for a provisional license. And that may be, in many cases, the safest bet. What is a provisional license? It's a license that you can be that you can apply for and receive prior to locking down your real estate. So when you apply, you would apply without uh, a site selection and the site selection criteria, um, including buffer zones, but all of the um, all the other you know information that you'd be graded on, um, you know, like security plan and the like, would not be taken into consideration. You would just receive your paper provisional license, and you'll have twelve months to go find compliant real estate, and then finish the application process and hopefully receive your license. You'd have a year to do that. Um, in many, if not most cases, I think now in New York, the way things uh, have, have evolved, uh, the provisional license is something that I think a lot of people are going to take advantage of, um, particularly because of the thousand foot buffer zone and, um, and, and, and the, the, the vast opt-outs in, in many of the municipalities. Um, so, I think you know that that sort of covers it for now. Um, that's the highest level uh, sort of backdrop here. So I'll, I'll pause there and, and see if there's any questions. Jeff, I, I have a question. It's going back to the litigation against the OCM. Um, do you think that would delay the portal in any way from opening either in October or November and impacting not just retail but all license types uh, for 2023? Yeah. I I don't think so. Um, and I, I, I feel pretty strongly about that, actually. I, I don't think it's going to delay it. In fact, I think it, it has and will continue to expedite the licensing process because the core complaint um, at the heart of both of the RO litigation and the service disabled veteran litigation is really lack of opportunity to apply for a license. The basis of their claim is that there's a section in the MRTA, section 1019, that says that for retail, all initial retail applications, that window for all applicants will open at the same time, full stop. There's no mention of card, there's no mention of anything like that. Um, so you know, the, the, the basic uh, argument that ever, both parties have made, plaintiffs in both lawsuits have made is, hey, we were told we could apply at the same time. You guys have not opened the app window, you have slow rolled this whole thing, you put the card program first and we are in, under the MRTA are entitled to apply along with them or anybody else. So, um, so I think the OCM is keenly aware of that. And I actually think that that it 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 makes me lean in favor of seeing that applicant, the, the portal open very soon. In fact, it may end up what that may be what resolves the lawsuit in part. Great. Thank you. Um, and then when selecting a law firm uh, to work with, what what is more important for the applicants to focus on? Is it having solid corporate and regulatory experience or more or less understanding the cannabis industry as a whole? Um, great question. I, you know, in a perfect world, it's both. If, you know, you want both. Uh, it's not easy to find um, really high quality corporate attorneys, uh, regulatory attorneys um, or platform uh, law firms that can service everything that you're doing. Uh, from from the application all the way through becoming operational and everything that happens thereafter, full life cycle of the business, um, including restructuring, unfortunately, um, it is cannabis. So it is relevant. Jeff Finkel mentioned it earlier um, and why, you know, wind downs and, and uh, 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 receiverships. You can't say bankruptcy quite yet. Uh, we just published a piece on that. But, um, you know, it's it's why I joined Foley. We we do all of that. Um, we have corporate, we have real estate, we have employment lawyers, we have a great application writing team. Um, we cover it soup to nuts, full life cycle. So I think in a perfect world, you have attorneys that do all of that. Fantastic. Well, Jeff, Jeffrey Schultz, thank you so much for your time. Um, you mentioned real estate before. It's a great segue to kind of go into Kristen Jordan's world here. Kristen, if you could give, give yourself um, a brief, give everyone a brief overview of, of yourself um, and your expertise in the real estate market. Well, thank you, Jason, Jeff, Carolyn, for uh, hosting this 
very important event. Um, I, uh, I'm very appreciative to be part of this um, panel of experts. Uh, my name is Kristen Jordan. Uh, I wear a number of hats, as everybody does in the industry at this point. Uh, I think I should probably mention I'm an adjunct professor, professor at LIM College. We just finished our first year and are starting our second year with the business of cannabis major uh, for both undergrad and graduate school, and I teach cannabis regulations. Uh, and, and a social equity class as well. Uh, I am also uh, the CEO and founder of the Asian Cannabis Roundtable, a networking organization, and we just recently launched our membership. Um, and let's see, what else? Uh, I run a newsletter called The Maze Calendar, M-A-Z-E, and that's a free publication that lists all the uh, cannabis events that are legal and compliant, uh, including webinars like this. Um, and it's free to subscribe. It's free to list. Uh, it's a great community service. It's a terrible business model. <laughs> and then I also serve, uh, as Jeff does, uh, on a number of different committees, uh, specifically the Cannabis uh, uh, Bar Association Committee on Cannabis, uh, the Minority Cannabis Business Association Policy Committee, uh, among other things. Uh, but today I'm here talking about real estate. And so I have my eponymous real estate brokerage firm called Park Jordan. Uh, I started this firm, uh, let's see, 2021, uh, because as a uh, uh, head of real estate for one of the uh, medical operators here in New York, I was lacking for a talent on the uh, real estate brokerage side to assist us. Uh, we really didn't have brokers and uh, real estate professionals who understood the regulatory side of this industry and the constraints around real estate. And that uh, sort of challenge really can jam you up, especially when you're sitting on a clock trying to apply for a license. So uh, we rolled out Park Jordan. Uh, my chairman of the board is uh, my business partner, Barrington Rutherford, who is uh, the former head of uh, real estate at another large MSO. Uh, and together we help and assist uh, small businesses, medium-sized businesses and the like in sourcing uh, real estate that is compliant for their cannabis business needs. Um, and as you've heard, and as you've probably experienced, real estate is a challenge uh, for every part of the supply chain, surprisingly. Um, you know, even obtaining office space can be challenging because the income from our businesses comes from cannabis or federally prohibited uh, business. Uh, but today we're going to talk real specifically and just an overview of, um, so that we can fit in everybody else's expertise. Uh, so we'll focus on retail and specifically retail dispensaries, because as Jeff alluded to, we don't have the regulations out uh, quite yet fully for on-site consumption. Um, so when we're talking about site selection for cannabis businesses and specifically for real estate, uh, for, excuse me, for retail dispensaries, we are first faced with the challenge of understanding which communities have opted in or out. And I'll save you the, the hard work in, in uh, figuring that out. There are a number of different maps. We can drop those uh, in the link in the uh, chat uh, so that you can figure out which towns and communities have opted in versus opted out. Um, and we're seeing some towns opt back in. And certainly there's a concerted effort around uh, bringing communities uh, back into uh, retail uh, opportunities for uh, cannabis businesses, especially in, in places like Long Island, where we've had so many uh, municipalities opt out of uh, allowing for, for retail businesses. And specifically, just as a reminder, the opt-in and opt-out is solely for retail businesses. It does not extend to the other parts of the supply chain. Um, so first and foremost, we've got uh, opt-in and opt-out. So you found a community that will allow you to host your retail dispensary. And then we've got to make sure that we're abiding by the buffers and the setbacks. And in our, in my world, in real estate, uh, a setback uh, for uh, the cannabis industry is very similar to what we see on the uh, liquor and the alcohol side in that uh, we, we've identified certain sensitive uses, uh, typically houses of worship, uh, churches, synagogues and the like, uh, schools and places where youth, young people will assemble. So specifically in New York, we have setbacks that are uh, 200 foot, meaning that uh, you cannot be, your cannabis dispensary business cannot be located within a, a 200 foot um, uh, 
distance from a house of worship, worship that is specifically exclusively used as a house of worship. And, and make sure you note that, especially in places like New York City, where potentially you might see uh, buildings being used uh, for multi-purposes and not solely exclusively for the use of uh, that we're describing here. Uh, so exclusive use by a house of worship, 200 feet on the same street uh, as your cannabis business. Uh, similarly, we've got a 500 foot setback for schools that are again exclusively used for schools. If the school is being, if the building is being used for dual purposes or multi purposes, that does not qualify. It has to be exclusively used. And then lastly, we have this new definition of a public youth facility. Uh, and let me, I just wanted to read that definition so we're clear on that. A public youth facility, as it pertains to cannabis businesses, means of location or structure owned by a government or government sub -agent, subdivision or agency that is, is accessible to the public where the primary purpose is to provide recreational opportunities or services to children or adolescents of whom the primary population is reasonably expected to be 17 years of age or younger. And that's a, that's a new um, uh, setback that we have if and when the municipality decides to enact that into law. So everywhere in New York State, we've got our 200 foot house of worship setback, our 500 foot school setback, and then this additional 500 foot public use facility setback is only if your municipality adopts that and enacts that as law. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is how we measure those distances, right? There was a lot of talk uh, in earlier iterations about measuring perhaps from lot line to lot line. Uh, in our current set of regs, we know that the measurement is placed from front door to front door. And that is the door that you are using that has hardware that is your egress and ingress and the main, the main source of egress and ingress for uh, whatever business that is. Uh, as it pertains to um, your buffer. Uh, the only exception to that is with a public youth facility, which may include, for instance, a ball field and may not have a structure that has a door, for, uh, as an example. In that situation, the measurement is from the point of the grounds. So that extends it, right? Like it makes it a little bit closer because there is no structure there. Uh, from the point of the grounds or the nearest structure. So if there is some sort of structure, perhaps it's not a building, um, you know, maybe it's some other sort of structure, those are the points of connection uh, that you would take your measurements. So real important there. Um, let's see. Uh, Kristen, just, Kristen, I have one question, sorry. Yeah, Before you get off the zoning, um, for the distance between house of worship or um, other entities that are in the rules and regulations, can municipalities override or make changes to those that distance for house of worship, schools, youth centers, et cetera? Or is it everyone has to follow the rules of regulation that's provided by the OCF? Well, interestingly enough, so uh, we have some rules for, for the municipalities, and they're only allowed to um, dictate time, place, and manner. And I don't want to step on, step on Jeff uh, Gio's uh, time. I think he's going to address some of that. Uh, in his uh, discussion of the municipalities. But yes, the municipalities are only allowed to dictate time, place, and manner. Literally the time of operation for the businesses, um, you know, uh, parking, traffic, odor mitigation, no noise mitigation, those sorts of things. Uh, and Jeff will address those a little bit more fully in his presentation, I believe. Great, thank you. Awesome. Um, and just, you know, some high level points of, of distinction of uh, many uh, municipalities are now choosing their zoning restrictions um, and, and their zoning codes. I know uh, the city of Binghamton was one of the earliest to roll out zoning uh, specifically for cannabis. Um, you'll notice in a lot of these zoning schemes, uh, oftentimes cannabis retail businesses are relegated to industrial parts of town, uh, sort of unsavory areas, not your traditional retail main and main areas. Uh, so those are things that you want to keep in mind when you're talking to municipalities and as they're uh, in, in uh, creating these uh, rules around their zoning um, to make, make sure that they're aware that this is a, you know, a highly regulated business. Um, we are not necessarily a liquor store and we don't need to be relegated to the back corners of your communities. Uh, let's see, we've seen a, a, quite a bit of nimbyism uh, occurring um, in various communities, uh, you know, not in my backyard, in somebody else's backyard. 
uh, you know, it's important for us as business owners to come out and make sure we're supporting all parts of the supply chain, especially when they're in front of uh, municipalities and, and dealing with that sort of attitude. Uh, security, of course, is a, a big issue. Uh, we've got uh, some folks talking about that later in, in, the, in the program, but in terms of real estate, man, we want to be very aware of what our box looks like, what our uh, vulnerabilities are. We've seen in, from our friends in California that, that uh, many attempted robberies happen through roofs, and so being cognizant and mindful of, of those uh, vulnerabilities uh, when you're sourcing your real estate are really important. Uh, certainly, um, we're talking about retail, but on the cultivation side, uh, access to utilities uh, is something that you're going to want to pay uh, close attention to. And then we just listed some um, uh, average build-out costs. Now, I know I know folks are going to want to push back on a lot of those numbers, but those are what we see in the industry, and I would actually say that those are probably a little low. Um, and then I just gave a, a sample uh, timeline. In a perfect world, if we had this, this amount of time to do this in a proper search, uh, we'd probably take about a year to, to source your site. And we would probably be chasing three or four sites at the same time. Uh, we're not in a perfect world. And we live in this uh, um, uh, cannabis world where you know time is of the essence, speed to market is an issue. Uh, so uh, truncating that is real challenging. Um, you know, uh, But keeping in mind that that these all have to happen in the sequence that they happen. Uh, and many uh, also include uh, sign-offs and uh, inspections that are uh, prerequisites to the, moving on to the next step. Uh, last thing I'll bring up, and Jeff touched on this a little bit, is the provisional provisional licenses. And you know, we've seen some states roll out where provisional licensing does not include uh, the retention or, or um, uh, control of real estate. And you know, I think. Uh, smart on the regulators for identifying real estate as being one of the pain points for this industry. However, what we've seen in New Jersey specifically, our neighboring state and probably um, the most uh, uh, similar to what we can experience here in New York, is that under their conditional licensing, we've got what we call uh, phantom licenses. Number of folks who went out and got their provisional license and then came back to look for the real estate only to find out there wasn't anything. Nothing that complied, nothing that was affordable, uh, nothing within the, the town or vicinity that they wanted to be in. And we're seeing that already, even with the just handful of card winners that are out and able uh, to secure their real estate. Man, the challenge is you want to cry when you hear these stories. I mean, they uh, feel like they have this golden ticket uh, to generational wealth, as you put it, Jeff, uh, only to find out that uh, there's no real estate that comports with it or it's just not affordable. So I'm a little bit concerned about the idea of a provisional license. I worry that people are going to spend a lot of money on the consultants and attorneys uh, to get those prov provisional licenses only to not be able to operationalize them. Uh, I do think it's important to uh, consider that when you're thinking about uh, applying for a license is how do you retain this real estate? You know, do you have somebody with, uh, you know, landlords at this point, uh, because of the card program, are well aware of whether or not their sites are compliant. And, you know, they're double trading them, um, very much so, uh, because the only requirement is to have an LOI. And a letter of intent is not a binding document that does not bind your landlord to your deal. That landlord will retrade that deal left, right, and center uh, because they're motivated to do so, especially when they know about the buffers and the setbacks and, and the like. So I and think that's a, my overview, Jeff. Jason. And I would <laughs> imagine Long Island is probably one of the biggest pain points from a real estate perspective, considering that 90% of the municipalities opted out. And that's it's just right. a sliver of real estate available that's zoned correctly for this. I got I got to give a lot of kudos to the folks out on Long Island who are doing the hard work of educating their regulator or their uh, communities and their town supervisors and the like. There's a lot of folks out there doing that hard lift, uh, and that's important because we need to bring those those communities online. Great, thank you, Kristen. Thank you for that overview. Okay, uh, Jeff Giu, you are next in line to talk about the municipalities. Oh. Good, everyone. Oh, Th th thanks, thanks so much to our, our friends at RQ for having me today, and thanks to my other panelists for, for, for providing a really insightful presentation. Um, brief background on me. Uh, my name is Jeff Gio. I'm a founding partner at Millennial Strategies. We are a 10-year-old government and public relations shop. Um, since um, since the signing of the MRTA, cannabis has become one of, one, of our, one of our larger focus areas. I do occasionally regret that these days, but you know, here we are. Um, 
specifically, um, we've helped a lot of companies um, influence policy in Albany. I'm a, I am a registered lobbyist up there, and we also do a lot of work um, in, in in a lot of the downstate municipalities trying to win local support um, for cannabis projects. And um, wh wh while it is true that it is the OCM who has the power to initially approve sites, um, for, for, for dispensary use and uh, eventually other uses, um, that's only half the battle um, because um, every municipality, including the city of New York, um, ha has their own rules that you have to abide by in order to open. Um, so for folks that are looking at, um, you know, applying for a license when they open and, and to, to, you know, to, to other Jeff, not Jeff Finkel, but other, other, other Jeff's earlier point, um, we don't know when that's going to be, but regardless, like if, if licenses are open in October and you're not already engaging your local government, what are you waiting for? Um, because like th these things can take a really, really long time, um, to be able to go, go, go through the appropriate amount of zoning to get these businesses to open. So, um, and, and this is especially true. Um, I, I'm coming at you live from Long Island. I know I have a couple other Long Islanders here. It's especially true in places like Long Island, Westchester, some of these um, counties and, and areas where there's just a lot of government, right? Um, here in Long Island, we have we 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 have we, you have towns, you have you have villages, a lot of overlapping areas that have some zoning control. And what we what we've seen, not just with cannabis, but with many other issues over the years, is that these local governments love local control, um, and will and, and do not like giving it up to the state. So you know, making local government your friend is really, really, really important. Now, in in New York City specifically, um, you know, the approval um, to, at some level comes through the community board process, right? There are some community boards within the five boroughs that are notoriously difficult to deal with, right? The, the joke has always been, you know, try to build a 7-Eleven on the Lower East Side and then see, see what the community board says about it. It can take months. Now, we, we've seen some of that start to change in the five boroughs because there's so, so much illegal activity taking place. The community boards are starting to like the fact that there's going to be licensed regulated activity coming. But still, that engagement is really key. And once these floodgates open, there's going to be a lot of people competing for, for those for, for the attention of, the, of those boards. Very, very important. Also, um, worth mentioning, um, if you go outside of um, the five boroughs, Long Island, Westchester especially, um, every town has now created their own zoning code um, that, that the cannabis businesses must adhere to. This is especially true um, for folks who are going down the dispensary road. Uh, we, we represent a, a number of card licensees who have been before um, these towns um, in, in the New York City suburbs. Um, and it, it, it can be extraordinarily onerous um, to get through that process because oftentimes they will require some manner of special use permit um, some matter of parking variance. Local governments are addicted to parking. Um, like a, a, and like there will never be enough parking in your area. So you're gonna need to go and get a variance. And again, if you haven't built those relationships, um, you go to the back of the line. Um, and you know, I have I've had clients that have not managed this relationship the right way, um, or or have spoken to local government without us. Um, and, and they're told, yeah, listen, we'll we'll, we'll get to you in nine months, buddy. Sorry. Um, and th that's just the reality here. And you know, while yes, I do think that as a result of some of the elections that are coming up in November and some other factors, you will see more opt-ins in the suburbs. You got to play the hand you're dealt right now. Um, and right now on Long Island, there are four and only four towns that are allowing for dispensary activity. Of, of those four, two are um, have such onerous local regulations that almost no one's going to operate there. Um, so you're talking about a really, really limited pool. Um, and if you're going to, if you're dead set on doing this, um, you really have to start engagement now. Now, the other benefit too, is that if you are looking to do cultivation, processing, um, distribution, something along those lines, um, the, the local government opt out does not apply to those businesses as, as has been mentioned before. Um, but you're still going to need to educate local governments as to what these businesses are. Um, and why they should why they should be welcome in communities, because you know one one thing that I think a lot of people a, a lot of people don't really understand is that, and this is true in, in the city of New York, and this is true in the tiniest villages in upstate New York. Do not assume that the local government official you're talking to knows anything about what's happening in New York State cannabis. Anything. Um, I, I know we all live in this myopic world where we follow all these activities, but uh, like these folks do not. And when you are a local zoning commissioner, you are the king or queen of a tiny little fiefdom that you don't want to you don't want to lose control of. 
Um, and, and, and that fear exists with a lot of these folks. So education is key. A lot of times it needs to be done with velvet gloves. And it, I have had to explain what you know processing is as opposed to cultivation to, to so many local governments over the last two years, it would make your head spin. So um, that engagement is, re is, is really, really important. Understanding what the process is gonna be. Are you gonna probably need a special use permit, a parking variance, those things before you end up spending a lot of money on, on, on lawyers and real estate and guys like me um, is, is also really, really key. Um, the, the other thing I, 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 should, I should mention here is that the local governments can play a role in influencing the state too, if, if leveraged properly. So uh, we've mentioned a couple of times um, the thousand foot rule, um, which which can be very difficult to navigate sometimes. Um, oftentimes um, the zoning in local governments is really, really narrow. Only certain areas in like light industrial areas or areas near other adult businesses are gonna be permitted for cannabis. So having two dispensaries um, within a thousand feet of one another, um, you know, is it can, can and does happen a lot of the time where, where two folks will apply. Now, the state has, uh, installed a, a vessel for for relief here, where if the local government, I, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase the exact legal language. I I am not a lawyer. I, I've just faked it occasionally in my career. Um, but there, there 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 is a mechanism through which if the, a, a municipality um, comes to the state and says we want these guys in our community, um, the Office of Cannabis Management can grant relief and can allow those folks to open if they're previously being blocked from opening. Um, we, we've heard through a couple of sources, the OCM was considering doing that prior to this lawsuit kind of gumming things up a little bit. Um, the, and the last thing I mentioned to you is one other really important thing that we, that we found for folks is getting support letters from your, your town supervisors, from your county legislators, from your state legislators, um, saying that, you know, I, the elected official who represents this area, want this business. I want these folks as my constituents. I want people in my community to work here. That really goes a long way in influencing decision making. Um, so I, 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 I strongly urge folks, to, if you're not already thinking about how to do that, start thinking about doing that. Thank you, Jeff. And just out of curiosity, is there anything the OCM could do to streamline the approval process um, and get more businesses open? Well, I, I mean, the way the way it's worked with cards, to my understanding, and, and like. Folks like us are kind of like are not able to engage directly with the OCM when it comes to that inflection point. The applicant must do it. So what we've seen happen is applicant X submits property Y to the OCM, and then it kind of vanishes into a void. Um, and then after X amount of days, there's there, there's a decision made, and the process through which you grieve that decision, if you're not happy with it, um, could certainly use some clarification. Um, and some of the metrics th that, that that are used to, to to determine, you know, whether we're going door to door, lot line to lot line, like that that kind of stuff. I think there definitely is going to be a movement to try to find some sort of statutory relief um, <clears throat> for for these processes because ultimately, right now, the state is just dealing with the card licensees, or at least they were. Um, and if we open the floodgates to all the other license types, like there's got there's got to be a, a more transparent process. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Um, next we have up is John Ingle. Uh, so John Ingle is our application writer here at Open Consulting. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for- um, John, why don't you go ahead and do a brief intro and dive into you. There you go. Yep. yep. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is John Engel, and as Jason said, I do most of the application writing and strategy uh, here, and what we really focus on is looking at how to make an application win in a field that's competitive. So as Jason already said in the intro, we've worked in, in many states. So co from Colorado to California, where you have no limit on the number of licenses, it's purely a matter of ticking boxes versus a situation like New York, where you're going to have a finite number of licenses awarded of all classes. And the reason that that's a, like an application becomes more important then is that simply providing all the correct responses may not be enough to get like to win a license in that in that situation. It's about being not only uh, good, but great. And so in terms of the components of a winning application, now we would like to have been able to share a more comprehensive view of what New York's license, like, license application is going to look like. Unfortunately, we're gonna be left in the dark uh, 
for the time being in terms of addressing that uh, until we, until the, at least the 12th. But we do know so a great deal from many of the states in which we have previously worked and which have similar regulatory environments and similar plans and approaches to New York. So we use that we can use those analogs and we can review the draft regulations to tell uh, to give a basically a picture of what an application is probably going to look like. And if you look on the right hand side of like the presentation, you can see we pulled out a bunch of the components that we think will be in it. But the issue like and these are all elements that go into every app like any cannabis application wherever you are, like a site plan that includes issues of zoning, placement, architecture, operating plans, energy and environmental plan, which we know in this case in New York is gonna be very important because it's being placed uh, in a very high level of priority and lots of references to it and requirements in it within the regs. But like, then you also have like the security planning with inventory and tracking, seed to sale tracking, everything from record keeping to inspections and audits to it's uh, all myriad of standard operating procedures as well that need to go into the license application. What exactly, will be asked for will is remains to be seen. And the amount of space and basically word counts that you're given is also something that remains to be seen. So if we take, if you take like, for example, New Jersey's rules where almost every one of its 15 or so exhibits was no longer like was between five and 20 pages, you know, you have an exact idea of sort of how to like what they're asking for and getting towards crystallizing that story in places like Texas with their medical cannabis rules, no page limit, throw everything against the wall. So that's what we, our experience sort of teaches us is that every place is different, but you can learn from other markets and you can learn from the regs uh, as they're being promulgated, exactly what's going to be prioritized. And so that's where we come to like the components of winning app application. How does an application make the cut? You know, the first thing, bottom, like bottom line in this, in this market, because you're not gonna get a second chance with, uh, if you get something wrong is completeness. Like making sure that every answer to every question addresses every requirement under the regulation. And this is not always as easy as it sounds. In many, in many states, they'll use a, they'll, they'll only provide in the application a shorthand of what areas of the regulations they want you to address and may actually leave out specific areas that may end up becoming important points uh, for, for points down the line in a competitive um, elements. So completeness, addressing everything. And that is a meticulous and often uh, like Sisyphean task, but it is uh, critical to, especially in a market that is going to have just be inundated with applications and that they will be looking for reasons to disqualify applications as quickly as possible. So secondly, like uniqueness. So this is sort of where we specialize is that it's very important when there are many applications, when there are more excellent applicants than there are uh, available licenses, is telling a, a compelling story that makes your application stand out from the pack and can make the, diff the scorers who are working uh, frequently over time to look closer at you and, and understand that. That comes from everything like what's been said before, looking at uh, in, the, uh, in terms of, for example, like municipal support. It's in things uh, such as social equity, uh, social, social, social equity planning and economic impact. Having very thought, not only, not only by the numbers, but thoughtful answers is key. And that sometimes requires a degree of sort of call it creative writing and thinking beyond what would ordinarily be for sort of like a any no, any normal sort of government licensing pro program. And thirdly, then in terms of what's essential here is timeliness. And this has already been stated by almost everyone here is that there is going to be a very short window, however long it is open. It could be if the OCM really wants to go for it, you know, 30 days from uh, the release of the, app, uh, of, of the applications. That is a very short window and going uh, and makes, if you're starting now, conditional licensing almost essential. Uh, but in terms of getting an annual license and preparing that, pl like planning for that, the time really was yesterday to get started on this. So if you are 
anyone who's serious about getting into the into this market, which is going to be like the largest and most dynamic like in the country and with uh, what fairly uh, idiosyncratic profit opportunity for like for the initial entrance, uh, committing now, getting ready to go, so that you are ready bef pref like preferably the moment you like, it is possible to submit, being able to get in and get prepared. And uh, to speak briefly about the conditional versus annual license, uh, the, like the calculus, shall we say, um, the, the provisional licenses are going to be uh, like the, the best batch for most applicants in, the, in this space, but they are they, they themselves are not always easy. And again, you won't get a second bite of the apple. So the completeness in those even shorter applications is even more important, especially if like sort of less physical space to stand out. But it is also uh, worth considering simply from as uh, this was stated, yeah, you know, they're calling them phantom licenses, or in the case of New Jersey, like in the case of New Jersey, there were there are cases where uh, there are resale opportunities of conditional licenses. It's unclear what that what that will look like in New, in New York, but it is worth considering if you're thinking about applying for a license that there is a opportunity from the application standpoint to uh, create a valuable asset that like from the from the from the moment you get the like a provisional license. So it is a, a long term opportunity. There are so many things that need to be done so quickly. And it is uh, absolutely imperative that if uh, for anyone who's interested in entering this market to get to get in uh, right away. I think that's sort of the like the extent of, of what I have to say at, like this afternoon. I wish there was more to get into but in the absence of actually having any meaningful guidance about what the application will exactly look like, uh, it's like we can't go like can't get too deep into it. But that does make looking very closely and having people who can you know address those things at a in a timely uh, like in, and help to parse things once they become uh, live is important. Is uh, never more important. Thank you, John. Thank you. And, and I, I, I would say John and I work together quite a bit on all of our license applications um, and the pr provisional or the conditional license, as New Jersey calls it, is definitely an essential way to not only start to John's point, but also to for the real estate perspective, like Kristen mentioned and Jeff mentioned, but also for capital purposes, because now you have an actual provisional or conditional asset to actually raise capital to begin your operation. So it shows a good faith to your shareholders. John, I just I just have one one question for you. And I know we're getting to the top of the hour, so so apologize, but I, I feel like this is something that we should just at least address. You know, what are some of the biggest pitfalls for the first time license applicants do they encounter? I think the biggest one is not is just not understanding like the scale of the ask that that that's that's coming because you're dealing with architects, you're dealing with security planning, you're dealing with standard operating procedures. If you're not from this industry or, or like already, you, there is a steep learning curve that frequently trips people up as they as they as they try to enter it, and this it's steeper and uh, much slicker in markets like New York where where they are competitive. Great, great, John. Thank you. Obviously, good seeing you again. I, uh, we, we connect quite often, so um, thank you again, John. And uh, I just want to get to one more thing before I get to Desmond. So if you not, if you haven't uh, put any questions in the Q and A box, please do so. We could definitely address them either later after this after Desmond um, uh, provides his overview, or again after the webinar is done and finished, we can revert back to you. Um, okay, so Desmond, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you for the for your brief introduction, and then obviously your area of expertise. Sure. Thank you, Jason, and thank you to the ARCU team for the opportunity to uh, to share the space with so, so many great experts in the cannabis space. Uh, so I'm Desmond Lewis. Uh, I'm a social equity advocate. Um, I've started a couple of businesses myself, and I do some education around operations. And so. We've talked a lot today around the regulations, the licensing process, how to acquire real estate, how to apply for your license. So what happens after all of that is done? So you've got your license now and you need to now operationalize your retail business. So the first thing, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about a number of different areas. This of course is not an exhaustive list of, of, of approaches, but 
one of the first things I always say to people is, you know, reassess your business strategy, right? Hopefully as, well, you will as a part of your, your license application process, most likely have put together a business plan. Um, and so that business plan will be uh, almost in some cases, a point in time document, given it will be submitted as a part of your license uh, application. But as that time has passed, as you reassess some of the market, I always recommend people to look at the changing landscape in cannabis, which is quite changing, ever changing in New York, and go through an activity of reassessing that plan and your business strategy. Identify ways that you can update it, identify ways to amend it, uh, and make sure that you have that solidified before you start off on your process of operationalizing your, your dispensary. The second thing I always like to talk to people about is you have your business plan, which is really almost a roadmap. How are you going to measure that business plan? What are you going to do to measure where you're going? And that's really where your KPIs, your key performance indicators come in. So here, I always say, you know, you should lead by being data driven, right? By being data driven, it allows you to be able to, um, in a subjective way, understand how your business is doing, right? And so KPIs will be able to immediately identify areas of growth in your business or areas of possible weakness or concern. And so you should really, you know, formalize what those organizational and financial KPIs are before you embark on, on this process. You know, some of the KPIs that people often talk about are your labor costs, uh, maybe some external consumer trends and cannabis, you know, price points for your products. These are some of the things that you can measure in order to be subjective in your business decision making. So once you've done your business plan and your KPIs, you know, and hopefully you've acquired your real estate, um, some of you will have acquired your real estate. You know, the application doesn't, as it was mentioned earlier, doesn't require you to have real estate before you apply. But construction and store layout is a very important part that you have to do early on in your process. Uh, and so you need to select a experienced architectural design firm or general contracting firm. Some of those come in partnership with each other. So you go to a single organization that can provide both architectural and GC services. And you have to look at more than your physical design of your store. It's really about the experience your customer is going to have while they're shopping. Uh, it's really about how you're going to display your products. Um, you know, the design of your store directly impacts your ongoing expenses and your costs. <laughs> so there are some tax implications potentially, right, around how you design your store and, and how you physically do your layout, you know, your front of house versus your back of house. So it's very important that you focus in and hone in on your construction and store layout. One of the most costly parts of the of the retail uh, you know, operation side is your technology, your systems, and your IT, and your security. So when you're working in a regulated market like cannabis, it means you have to have a consistent tracking system, a consistent reporting system, and you also have, a, have to have a safe and secure environment for your people and your product. And so in addition, back to that data-driven decision-making point I made, Having your technology all connect, your entire technology stack connect from front of house to back of house to your operations can help you reduce your cost. It can help you also drive your growth and drive your sales. So you want to look at what point of sale systems you have, what inventory management systems you have. That may be one system on, in, uh, you know, by itself. Um, your in-store technology experience, how are customers engaging with your products and, and your store? your online retail experience, and how all of that connects to your operations and your finance systems, right? You wanna be able to identify a way to cohesively connect all of those systems together. And of course, you wanna have a compliant uh, and, and thorough security system. Um, it's not only about meeting the regulations, right? Which have very you know, stringent rules around how you should be managing your security process, but also ensuring you're providing a safe and secure environment for the people who work in your store as well as protecting your products. One of the areas I think a lot of people overlook, um, and, and this may you know, be a part of your application process, is how are you engaging your community? Um, and so recognizing you'll hopefully have done some of this work as a part of your application, uh, meaning you will have engaged community stakeholders, you'll engage elected officials, you hopefully will have engaged nonprofit organizations, Building a positive relationship with your neighbors and your community-based organizations can have a significant impact on the success of your cannabis business, um, including making a difference in your community, which is really important to me. Um, so not only that, some of the KPIs for your business could be if you engage your community in a holistic basis, you can increase your customer loyalty. Um, you can create a positive reputation for your business. 
I always like to describe engaging your community as doing good and doing well at the same time. And I think if you can find that real balance, it's a recipe for success. Um, staffing and training is another area where I think people um, you know, you know, really take for granted. Um, you're gonna be working in a high performance, high risk and a highly regulated environment. And so staffing and training is extremely important in the dispensary operations process. And New York is a very new market, as we all know, right? So a local pool of uh, experienced staff on the regulations is going to be somewhat limited, although a local pool of retail experience in New York City is, is quite plentiful. And so you shouldn't um, take for granted that you'll have to do a, you know, a quite a bit of training on the regulations uh, and be able to ensure that your staffing is experienced around how they can manage the products in your store. You are required under, regu under the regulations to have an employee in charge, uh, and you're also required to have a, a staffing uh, plan and a training plan for your staff. And so what I always like to say is you should look to onboard and train your staff at least 30 days in advance of your launch. I think that gives you enough time to be able to do on-site training of your staff, which is the most ideal, and really you know, create a, uh, a seamless process for staffing and on onboarding of your training of your uh, training of your staff. Inventory management, again, is another important part of operationalizing your retail uh, business. Uh, and this is not just about tracking your products. Um, it's about keeping a thorough record of your products, doing regular audits of your products. You know, some of the best practices we see in retail operations is looking at maybe auditing a category of product a week. Maybe one week you do your flour, or one week you do your vapes, one week you do your edibles but really continuing to build a best practice of inventory management and keeping track of all the products that enter and exit your store is not only gonna be uh, a regulatory requirement, but it's also gonna make for a prudent best practice in your business. Connected to inventory management is also your product acquisition strategy. So you need to develop this strategy to support not only the initial order for your product when you're opening your store and you're operationalizing your store, but also controlling the ongoing cost of procuring product, which again is gonna be one of your largest costs of your business, right? Your people and your product. Um, and so you wanna, again, go back to that data-driven decision-making is look at your sales projections in your business plan or in your financials. Um, look at your sales patterns after you get open. Um, how are you gonna replenish your product? What are those timelines? What are some of the KPIs you're gonna to develop to measure when you should be doing that? You know, you're gonna well and link those KPIs um, to this exact activity of your product acquisition. You wanna understand some of the brands and products that are in the New York market. New York's a very new market, right? So educating yourself is gonna be very important. But there's a whole host of things like navigating your, you know, the number of SKUs you're gonna have in your store, looking at the product categories, what's the ideal uh, cannabis mix you wanna have. Um, and then you wanna also look at your procurement strategy. So are you gonna do just-in-time inventory management or are you gonna use some other a procurement type strategy to make sure that your product mix is the right one. Uh, as a part of your application process, you know, we're expecting that you're they're going to be a need to, for you to develop standard operating procedures or SOPs. And so you may already have some of this done. I always recommend that people re-look at those SOPs uh, when they're looking to operationalize their store. Um, and because you know your uh, you know you may have not had a location when you put your application in, and therefore the location could dictate some changes in your SOPs. You have staffing changes, you have product, you have this store design build out. All of those things impact your SOPs, and so you should really relook at it and constantly look at whether your op your SOPs satisfy the requirements of your business. So SOPs around you know your HR and your people, your uh, operations and finance, your inventory. SOPs on your product and merchandising, your compliance and security. These are just some examples of SOPs you should have in place in your, um, in your store. So we've got a lot of the hard part done when you're operating, or the harder parts, let's call it, in operationalizing your dispensary. You now wanna plan for your launch. So you wanna start to execute you know, your marketing and PR strategy. Again, some of you will already have done that as a part of your licensing process. Uh, and so I would recommend doing a pre-opening or a soft launch that will help you, you know, you know, get out all the kinks in your in your operations um, before you do a grand open. Um, you know, I would also start to do things like get your business on uh, external platforms like Yelp uh, and Facebook uh, and Google My Business. Google My Business is a great tool. 
Um, these are extremely important in letting people know you, you are out there, that your business exists. Um, you know, using a pre-launch strategy will also help your staff, um, you know, allow them to make mistakes, allow them to learn more on the, on, on the job. Um, and so doing all of that prior to your grand opening, I think is important. And then when you have your grand opening, turn that into an opening day, a big event, uh, make a big splash about that. Consider doing some public relations, reach out to local newspapers and local um, uh, TV stations and let them know that you're here. Cannabis is such a new topic. It's such a hot industry in New York. There's a lot of interest in, uh, from uh, you know, news stations and newspapers to cover store openings. And so I would leverage some of that to plan for your launch. And then confirm compliance, remain compliant is what I always like to say. So prior to your store opening, you wanna do your own audit check or you wanna do an audit check to make sure that you're checking all the regulatory boxes and that you're continuing to meet all the regulations. You are gonna to have to go through an audit by the OCM before you open your store. And so doing that on your own, I think is gonna be very important um, to ensure that you uh, don't fall foul of any issues when OCM comes and you're, let's say several days from opening your store, you don't want OCM to throw any curveballs at you because you missed something in, in your process. And so you should really go through that process in advance of your pre-launch uh, as well as well in advance of your, um, your grand opening. Um, and so, and that will involve a lot of things that we talked about earlier, right? Looking at your inventory tracking processes, your record keeping, your staffing plan, your SOPs, uh, your training manuals. These are some of the things that we expect uh, OCM to be looking for when they're doing their audit before your store opens. Um, and then you'll have to renew your license at some stage, right? I think it's every two years in New York. Um, and so you wanna be able to, uh, you know, talk about uh, and make sure that you're remaining compliant in that process, right? And so having an ongoing remaining compliance mantra in your business, I think is gonna be important. And then the final thing um, really is continuing to review your business. Um, you wanna have an ongoing business mental, ongoing business review mentality. Um, you wanna ensure that all of your systems are doing as they expected. All of your processes and procedures are continuing to do that. This is kind of, kind of connected to the ongoing audit, right? I would recommend people having weekly staffing meetings, particularly with your senior management. I would recommend people to do monthly business reviews, um, do a competitor analysis, continuing to analyze the market and making sure that you're doing everything to position your business um, in the most um, advantageous way. And so all of these things in your business need to continue to be refined and, and fine-tuned. Um, and these are just some of the areas that, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the things that um, I would recommend and educate people on, on how to continue to, um, to keep your business compliant, to keep your business growing, and to operationalize your retail business. Desmond, thank you so much. And, you know, the last point, uh, the competitive analysis makes a lot of sense. How would somebody, when oper operationalizing a retail store, how would they make themselves unique to, to others in the marketplace? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think where, um, where we're seeing people be successful just in retail in general, but in cannabis also is um, educating your consumer, right? You wanna be, you wanna make your store a hub of education and knowledge for people, right? People always use the phrase canna curious, they use the phrase um, sort of cannabis novice. People, a lot of people coming into your stores may not be as educated as you are on the cannabis space. And so you wanna offer materials to your customers to help educate them. Um, you wanna be able to um, educate them on how to consume, um, how to choose the right products. Um, what are the effects of the products on them? So I think stores that take an educational mindset at the core of their strategy, um, I think are gonna be able to drive sales and drive customer acquisition and really uh, differentiate themselves in this, in this market. Fantastic, great response. Thank you so much. Okay, so that concludes our, uh, our panelists for, for tonight. I'm gonna hand this over to Jeff Finkel for a couple of words. I know we're running really short on time. So Jeff, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Well, you guys got some great gems today. I mean, just to name a few, don't get caught flat-footed from Jeff Schultz. Also, we don't, very important, we don't expect the OCM litigation to delay the opening of the portal. I know a lot of people will be deeply comforted by that. From Christian Jordan, zoning restrictions limit real estate choices, so pay attention. Jeff Guillou told us to manage the relationship with your local government, do it early, and do not, many of them, 
Be aware, do not understand this industry, so assume zero knowledge. John Engel mentioned critical importance of being complete and on time and telling a compelling story. Um, and Desmond told us a lot, but what I loved most was about engaging community, about doing good and doing well can be done at the same time. I love this. So look, great stuff. I hope you all got value today. I know I learned a lot. So let me thank all of you panelists for your contribution. Again, very insightful. And of course, our strategic alliance partners who make this possible and you, our viewers. I'd like to also quickly acknowledge our production team, Carolyn and Guillermo for managing the back end and Connor for managing live streaming. So this replay will be added to our library of programs on our website, I think sometime next week. So for those of you um, who wanna uh, get a link to that or reuse it, please, please reach out to Carolyn, she'll be happy to oblige. Please stay tuned for our upcoming live and digital programming. Um, and again, thank you so much. That does it and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all. Thank you.